Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to today's very special edition of Kibitzing with Kagan. Today, I am chatting with my friend, former House colleague, Congressman Anthony Brown, a candidate for Attorney General. Congressman, thank you so much for taking the time. Senator, it's great to be on. And as you mentioned, it was wonderful serving with you in Annapolis. Uh, so thanks for having me today. Absolutely. So Congressman, we're going to start by giving you 60 seconds on the clock to talk about your background, why you're running, kind of anything you want before we start just a million different questions. You may begin. Got it. Uh, first of all, I'm a first generation American. My father came to this country uh, out of poverty in Kingston, Jamaica. When he graduated uh, college and the first in our family to do so, he went to medical school in Switzerland where he met my mother. Like so many Americans who've come to this country, for a better way of life for their family and to make a contribution to the greatness that is this country. Um, so in my father, father's sort of footsteps, I uh, committed myself to serving people. I went to law school. I served in the military, as you mentioned, uh, in the House of Delegates in Annapolis, Lieutenant Governor, now finishing my uh, third term as a member of the United States Congress. And I want to build on those experiences uh, and my relationships in Maryland to serve as Attorney General to make an even bigger impact in the lives of our neighbors, our community, our great state. Fantastic. You've got 10 more seconds. Wow. And uh, I look, I mean, I might as well ask up front, you know, I'm asking for your vote on July 19th, uh, but I'm looking forward to our, our conversation uh, this sure. morning. Perfect. Good. Um, so were you a good student growing up? Um, I was a I was a really good student and, and I wasn't the smartest in the class, uh, but I worked really hard. And and even to this day, I believe that, you know, look, I, I want I like people who are, you know, work hard and are smart. Uh, but I'll take work hard over smart any day because I think a lot of it in life is showing up and giving it your all. Um, so I, I'd say I, I, I was a hard working student. Excellent. Um, what did you think you wanted to be uh, when you grew up as a, as a child? Well, in sixth grade, Mrs. Gallo um, said to me, Anthony, I think you're going to be an attorney when you grow up. You can be anything you wanted. I didn't know what an attorney was. I had a limited vocabulary uh, in sixth grade. If she said lawyer, that would have been the end of it. Uh, I looked up attorney in the in the actually the encyclopedia, not the dictionary. I don't know why we had World Book Encyclopedia in the house. Next to attorney was attorney general. Believe it or not, this is true. Yeah. And the U.S. Attorney General fighting for justice and civil rights. I said, yeah, Mrs. Gallo, Mrs. Gallo is right. I want to be an attorney. I'm going to be an attorney one day. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so talk about your spouse and your family. Sure, Carmen, uh, who is just sort of like my everything. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I'm in, I'm in my, my second marriage. I, I look, I, I married two wonderful women uh, in my life and, um, uh, and raised uh, three children uh, with, um, you know, my, my first wife and those children. And now Carmen, uh, she's wonderful. She's funny. Uh, she's just gorgeous. Uh, she's smart. Uh, and, you know, we, you know, mutually just support each other um, in the things that we do, whether it's our work life, whether it's our personal interests. Um, and, um, you know, every day I say to her, really, uh, and, if, and if I get up and out of the house before she does, I text her and I say, I can't wait until the best part of the day. And that's when I come home to see you. Oh, that's so sweet. And yep. in your TV ad, she even says she's going to vote for you. So that's something, you know. <laughs> it took a little bit of convincing, yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's shift to politics. Why are you a Democrat? Um, the Democratic um, a party, if you will, the, the platform, the principles are um, kind of what I grew up with. My, my father, um, you know, he raised me in a house and, and, and my siblings um, to like give, uh, you know, to, to, to serve other people. Uh, to consider other people, to uh, think about our our relationships, to think about um, opportunities and 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 equality, um, and 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 those are some of the things that the Democratic Party stand for: fairness um, uh, under the law and treatment of one another. Um, and so, you know, that's why I, I I grew up as a Democrat. Although there were times in my life when I didn't know if my father was a, a Republican or a Democrat, only because he got a lot of junk mail and they came in from both parties. So uh -huh. I, I didn't know. But all I know, he, he was someone who really uh, instilled in me the sense of, you know, being in service to others. And I just think that Democrats just do that more. Uh, we do it better. Um, so that's how I became a Democrat. My first election, I voted for uh, Jimmy Carter in 1980, his reelect. He lost. 
say, boy, let this not be a trend for me. Wow. Wow. Okay. My first uh, election was Ted Kennedy, 1980. So um, who is your political hero or shero, living or dead? Yep. And just recently departed Elijah Cummings. And I had the, you know, the, the privilege uh, of being able to serve with him uh, in the House of Representatives and like totally revered, respected, awesome person um, and uh, left us with, you know, um, you know, so much, um, uh, not only uh, his legacy, uh, but a really call to action to continue in his footsteps to do the, the, the great work that we're called to do. Uh, but I'd say Elijah Cummings and, and right next to that is, and I had the privilege of serving with John Lewis. Um, I mean, talk about like an opportunity to um, you know, serve with such a historic icon in the civil rights movement. Um, so I, but I, I'm, I'm staying with the Maryland guy here. It's, it's Elijah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great choice. Uh, let's pivot to the law since you are seeking to become Maryland's top lawyer. What was your, uh, what is, or was your favorite law TV show, TV show uh, featuring the law for lawyers? It was probably LA law. I think I was, I think I was in law school when LA law was on. So kind of fast pace, you know, and um, a, a diversity of characters, different motivations to practice law. Um, and uh, so I think LA law probably. Good one. But I, I'm, I'm a little bit too young for Perry Mason. Uh, I'm, I'm a little, yeah, a little bit too young for yeah. Perry Mason. Right. And uh, so LA law, I think is, is, is uh, top of the list for me. There you go. What would you say is your number, the number one value that guides your work? Um, I think um, uh, honesty and, and integrity. Um, you know, I remember when, um, and it didn't, it didn't start when I was running for the House of Delegates or when I was elected, but I'm sure uh, you got the same advice from the, from the old timers in Annapolis when they, you know, when you got first got elected, they say, when you come down here, you know, your word is your bond. Your word is your and bond. Absolutely. You don't have to give your word or a commitment to anything. It's, but, but once you do, your word is your bond. So uh, for me, it's sort of like doing what I say when I, when I say I'm going to do it. Um, and if circumstances change and like, you know, and, and I'm in a different place, just be sure that you're, you're timely with that. You're, you're, you're clear and, and, and can express why it is that um, you, you may be doing things differently than what you originally um, set out to do or articulated. So I think kind of keeping your word. Um, being true to your word is is a is a value that it, that I it's something I value. Yeah, well said. Uh, what would you say that the average Marylander Marylander doesn't understand about the legal system? What's something that you would say that would inform them better? Um, that, um, well, they definitely understand that it's that that it's difficult to access. Um, that they definitely understand. Um, I think they probably don't understand. And it's, it's unfortunate that um, without an attorney, it's very difficult uh, to navigate the legal system. Um, and that when you enter a courtroom, there really are not people there um, to um, you know, advocate for you or, or support one position or the other. It's a, it's a neutral forum. Um, and so you do have to go in well prepared. And unfortunately, um, it does require an attorney. Obviously, if it's a criminal case and you can't afford one, we know one will be um, 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 assigned to you at no cost. But there's so many other proceedings, think landlord tenant um, and, and um, where, you know, or, or civil matters, small claims court uh, where people show up and, um, and they're expecting that kind of justice just happens. But unfortunately, in the legal system, um, those who are represented uh, in court uh, statistically tend to do better. So um, I know in the congressional office, when we get constituent service requests for constituent services that look sort of legal in nature, mm -hmm. we all always talk constituents through, you know, when and how and, and you know, an attorney might be appropriate in this particular matter. Nice. Um, a lot of attorneys general have an issue that's kind of a pet priority of theirs. What might be yours? Right. And, you know, I'm not sure if I characterize it a pet priority, but certainly like a priority um, is I want to stand up an independent um, civil rights division. There is a civil rights division in the Office of the Attorney General, um, and uh, but one that has um, independent enforcement authority. Um, and um, right now, uh, the majority, almost all the attorneys in the in the Attorney General's office that are uh, engaged in the civil rights um, civil rights law um, uh, advise the Maryland Civil Rights Commission, and they do a good job. 
Um, but when I think about things like um, defending um, the rights of the LGBTQIA plus community, uh, when I think about voting rights and not just voter suppression, because the attorney general can bring voter suppression actions, but voting rights, um, access to uh, voting locations. When I think about now is particularly in, in this environment with uh, what we're going to see more and more assaults on women's reproductive um, uh, freedoms and access to uh, services and care. Um, the attorney general should be able to play a more prominent role uh, in that. So uh, one of the things that I want to focus on is uh, establishing the authority, likely having to work with the General Assembly uh, to do that uh, so that we can bring those actions, not to undermine or circumvent or preempt the Maryland Civil Rights Commission, sure. um, but to enhance the work that they're doing. Great. And just to be clear, since it's so time sensitive, uh, you talked about women's rights and and, uh, and health care. Just want to be clear, abortion rights. Oh, absolutely. I've, I've, I've got a 100 percent voting record and okay. was endorsed by pro-choice Maryland action in this uh, campaign. Okay. Uh, and, uh, I don't, you may remember back in 1999 um, when there was the debate on the House floor, partial birth abortion, six years, only six years after Maryland had codified Roe into statute, um, you know, we were still sort of fighting off um, uh, attacks and efforts to restrict a woman's right uh, to, an, uh, to abortion and to choose. And um, there were a handful of members on both sides of the aisle who were asked to um, debate uh, for and against. And, um, and I was part of that, I think, five or six Democrats uh, that um, argued or debated against those restrictions and and throughout my my public service that that's the position i've advocated for um uh, fiercely thank you um let's shift to consumer protection there's a consumer protection division any particular priorities or issues that you'd be thinking about where you sure, the consumer pro consumer protection division is probably one of the oldest divisions uh, in the office uh certainly one of the oldest consumer protection divisions in the country i think it was one of the first that was established this year uh, it celebrates its 50th uh, anniversary, um, and some of the areas that I want to focus will be on um, privacy, privacy issues, data privacy, um, and, you know, I think that disclosure is so important, um, you know, so that consumers and patients uh, and, and just users, whether it's, a, it's, whether it's a, an app on your device or going into a brick and mortar and signing some agreement in order to purchase something, the, you, you have to be fully informed of what information about yourself uh, you're, you're sharing and that you're willing for that vendor or whatever platform to share. And it has to be plain language and that's the problem. Um, so many of these disclosures are pages and pages and pages. So we all scroll down to the bottom and click yes. And right. we don't realize that like, wow, we, we, we've given this vendor the uh, the authority to sell our data, yeah. and and maybe we maybe we're okay with that, but we should be informed. And unless the disclosures are in plain language, simple language, it's hard to really do that knowingly. We voted on plain language years ago, but I agree with you; it's a problem. Uh, very quickly, I um, uh, years ago, a couple of years ago, there was a flashlight app. And I had to say, yes, I can have access to my contacts, my text messages, my photos. I was like, for a flashlight app? No, no, go away. But people just say yes without thinking about it. So um, let me just say one other thing, which is kind of related to that. And the other question you asked about choice, um, we're going to have women who are going to come to Maryland from states like Texas and Oklahoma. And you can you we can already anticipate that law enforcement in those states yeah. are going to try to get gather data about their activities in Maryland. And we've got to figure out how we can defend and protect women who come to Maryland so that that information can't be used as evidence against them. Good one. Um, when so Attorney General Brian Frosch has worked both within Maryland and our judicial system, as well as in collaboration with other attorneys general around the country in national suits. How would you think about, if you were elected, how would you think about when to go national and when to just work solo? Look, I think um, um, the attorneys general uh, around the country uh, work well together, sometimes in a bipartisan way. Democrats and Republicans work together. Think about the opioid settlement 
um, that is now happening. Um, and, you know, the state, Maryland state is going to benefit, counties are going to benefit, and in turn, the residents of, of Maryland are going to benefit. That was bipartisan. We should always be looking for uh, those types of uh, collaborations. Years ago, we saw it with the tobacco litigation. And then there are going to be times when um, it, you, it may not be bipartisan, and it may be um, a, a bi-party line, right? I think, you know, given that Democrats, we tend to focus more on environmental enforcement and clean air, clean water. Um, mm -hmm. There may be a time where uh, an action needs to be taken against the EPA because they're rolling back environmental protection standards that impact the Chesapeake, and you're going to have to team up with more likely Democrats and Republicans. So, you know, hopefully we've got a Democrat in Pennsylvania and New York, uh, one in Virginia, which today we don't, uh, and in Delaware, uh, because you're going to want to team up with those attorneys generals to protect the interests of Maryland and yeah. Marylanders. Uh, so the, 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 the fundamental question is, are the rights, interests and privileges of Maryland at stake? And if so, does teaming up with another attorney general enhance the effort to protect those rights? OK, uh, we're going to pivot to the campaign. Tell me what you like best and least about uh, about campaigning for attorney general. Uh, I like best uh, door knocking uh, and any other form of voter engagement. Um, um, now, while you know we we've been doing a lot on Zoom, um, that, that's that's not the preferred um, uh, platform for voter engagement. I love these uh, um, uh, opportunities though with you. Don't get me wrong, uh, but I love being on the doors uh, and door knocking. Um, and um, I also like gripping and grinning outside of shopping centers. So I really like that contact. Um, and I like listening because um, I think, you know, I, I think back in 1997, my first campaign, I knocked on the door, they opened and I started talking. Mm. And, and now I knock on the door, introduce myself. Maybe I throw them a softball question and get a conversation going and listening to what people have to say. Um, and so I like that the most. And then, of course, what I don't like, and I think probably every candidate says <laughs> this, is fundraising, right? Yeah. Fundraising. However, you know, I think one of the ways that you look at fundraising is it, you are in a conversation with people, right? And I, 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 um, I in my, in my call room, uh, when I go into more often, um, I put up photos and pictures uh, that inspire me. I've got this picture of me with some foster care children in Baltimore. And I think about um, why am I asking someone for money for this campaign? Because I'm fighting for those children. And um, and then also I have other motivational um, uh, pictures. I had the, the famous picture of, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali uh, knocking down uh, uh, Joe Lewis. And, yeah. and I got that one there too, where he's got <laughs> a you know, fist across his chest. So, you know, it, you're in a conversation with people and it just happens to be you're asking for resources to help you connect to voters. Yep, I get it. Uh, let's pivot to some personal questions. Uh, first, what is your favorite sport to play or watch? Um, so, boy, that's a really hard one. I grew up playing lacrosse, right, which then was a springtime sport, although we know nowadays almost every sport is like 10 and a half months long. Right. Um, I grew up on Long Island playing lacrosse, and we know it's big in Maryland. Yep. Um, and, and more lately, though, uh, because my, my, my youngest son uh, grew up playing baseball, and I, didn't, I wasn't interested in baseball, didn't follow baseball. I'm still not a much of a baseball fan. But I, there's nothing more sort of like sort of gratifying than like a Sunday afternoon, whether it's at, you know, Nationals Park or, or Camden Yards, just sort of three hours, you know, watching baseball. And I love doing it with my with my sons. Nice. Nice. Um, did you pick up a new hobby during COVID? Um, I wouldn't say a hobby, right? I mean, because I tell you what, I was more, I was busier during COVID with these back-to-back -back Zooms. But one of the things that I was able to do is spend a lot more time uh, with Carmen because less commute uh, and in between Zooms, right? Uh, she was working from home. I was working from home and we did a lot of walking. And it was interesting, like we, we were one of those early war, 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 walkers. And I, what I mean by that, not early in the day, but like as soon as the pandemic hit and over time, as the weeks went by, we saw more and more people out walking. Yeah. And uh, so we just we spent a lot of time together during the pandemic uh, and uh, walking. So I wouldn't say any real hobbies, but certainly uh, qu more quality time with my uh, wife. Love it. OK. Um, what is your favorite junk food? My favorite junk food? um is probably i you know pizza i mean that's my kind of go-to junk food i have pepperoni pizza 
Uh, unfortunately, you know, growing up on Long Island in, in New York, uh, you're never going to be satisfied with pizza um, anywhere <laughs> outside of New York. So when Carmen and I go uh, to New York, we try to go twice a year for uh, to see a Broadway show. We go out to dinner uh, and we'll do whatever else. We, we really try to be tourists in New York. Yeah. Uh, but typically on the walk, because we always walk from the hotel back to Penn Station, uh, we'll stop in a, you know, a, some, you know, small greasy. cubbyhole, yeah. greasy New York pizza joint and have a traditional slice of New York pizza. Okay, public service announcement for you and for anyone watching. If you've never tried Old Bay on pizza, it is it is life changing. Like you wow. won't eat pizza without it afterwards. Okay. If, if you like Old Bay and I love Old Bay. All right. God forbid your house is on fire. Other than people or pets, what would you seek to save? I would probably seek to save this this case that I have all of my grandmother's correspondence in um, that I found in her home in Mandeville, Jamaica, when my father went down after my grandmother died, we were literally on the way out of her house because we had a realtor there. And I said to my father, hey, dad, what's in that wooden trunk? We opened it up. It was 70 years of letters, a letter from my uncle Alti when he was in World War II in North Africa to, to my grandmother saying, mom, if you have some friends, because my grandmother was only 13 when she had Uncle Alti. So he was like, mom, if you have any friends, you know, women uh, who wouldn't mind writing letters to a, uh, to a man who's in service uh, in, in North Africa, I really would appreciate that. And just letters wow. like that. Wow. And, um, yeah, I think she has every uh, birthday card, Valentine's, Mother's Day card ever sent to her. She never returned those letters because I saw a lot of the ones that I sent her, but I never got anything back, but that was fine. Wow. So that I would definitely grab. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, what's the best vacation you've ever taken? Where? Probably Vietnam. Um, I always wanted to go to Vietnam when I was in the army um, and I was in flight school. Uh, I was uh, trained by um, pilots who had flown in Vietnam. So I heard their stories about Vietnam, but what I was hearing was less about the missions they were on and what have you, but like the people that they met and the beauty of the landscape and the architecture. And, and it just kind of, you know, planted a seed in my mind. This was back in 1985. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carmen and I went in 2019. So many years later, and it was just beautiful. The people are warm and welcoming. The landscape, the geography, the topography is beautiful. We were on Heilong Bay for a, a, a night or two. We went out to uh, uh, Asapa for the terrace rice patties. Um, and we were on the on the the Mekong uh, in the Delta on one of those, you know, little rickety skiff things, a little boat things, whatever. And it was just, you know, it was a really just enjoyable, memorable uh, vacation. Lovely. Um, do you have a song or an anthem, a, a, a song that lifts you up and inspires you? Uh, Michael Jackson, Can You Feel It? And I won't even try to, feel, uh, uh, to sing it, but he talks about the whole world coming together now, right? Different people, different colors, different stripes. And it's a very optimistic one. In fact, in 2014, um, it was one of my, uh, it was on my playlist for my, for my 2014 gubernatorial campaign. Nice. All right. Social media, what are your thoughts, the balance of sort of good and evil? You know, I'd, I'd like to see us get to a place where social, uh, the platforms themselves, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or any other, uh, has the same uh, responsibilities and obligations that we have for print media, um, where, you know, there's a, a level of responsibility to make sure that um, information is accurate um, and, um, uh, and then we also have that for, you know, for the, um, you know, like television, TV, um, and because there's just so much, um, um, misinformation out there. And, you know, I know we can always, you can always say, well, you know, misinformation can fight misinformation or, or accurate information can fight misinformation. That's easier said than done. Sorting through just the volumes and volumes of information that's available. Um, that, that really concerns me. And uh, so if we could establish, and I think Congress has to step up, um, you know, to, to expect 50 states to do that on a piecemeal basis, um, that's difficult. I think Congress needs to set uh, um, to to impose some sort of obligations, you know, and, and we, we, you know, I say we, it was before I was in Congress, you know, granted immunity to these um, these mm -hmm. platforms uh, from mm -hmm. libel and defamation actions. And and I I think that, you know, we should we should remove that immunity from liability. Yep. Um, make a pitch, if you would, for a nonprofit that you support personally. 
Sure. Uh, UCAP, United Communities Against Poverty, they're in Prince George's County. Um, I've always, um, where I was able to under the different ethics rules that govern what an elected official can do and not do, I've always encouraged people to contribute to U UCAP. Uh, they have a, um, you know, a, a shelter uh, for women and their, and their children. Uh, they have a food pantry. They've been around for a long time um, and um, they're in um, the Sea Pleasant um, area in, um, uh, in uh, Prince George's County. Um, and they just do wonderful work. Uh, they, 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 they raise money, they, they successfully compete for grants. Um, but, you know, as we saw during this pandemic, pandemic, so many of these nonprofit service providers, you know, they really struggled and they wrestled and where the, the demand went up, the resources went down, at least initially they did. And then of course, with the federal uh, congressional aid, um, you know, they were able to make it through and, and support people. So UCAP, that's the, that's the one that I support. Great. Uh, Anthony, Congressman, uh, talk about how Black Lives Matter, how um, the murders of, of Freddie Gray and George Floyd affected you personally. You know, it, it, um, um, I've always been concerned for particularly my, my children. You know, I'm, I'm raising, now, no longer, they're now young adults, you know, um, three African-American men. Um, and, you know, I'm sometimes fearful uh, when they go out wondering what they're going to encounter, uh, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's among law enforcement or, you know, I think about um, uh, Lieutenant Richard Collins, who was murdered at College Park uh, the day after he was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Army and was about to graduate from Bowie State University. And it was a hate crime. Yep. Um, and, and I thank the legislature for refining the hate crime statute so we can more successfully bring those. But, you know, um, when you when you see what happened with with Freddie Gray, when you see what happened with uh, with uh, George Floyd, it really motivates me even that much more uh, to focus on how do we how do we improve policing through police accountability, strengthening the relationships and partnerships with the community, because that's going to result in better, um, a safer communities. But it starts with um, confidence that the public needs to have. Uh, in the police. So that's why I supported the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. I, 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 am, I commend the Maryland General Assembly, the only state, I believe, after um, George Floyd's murder that made any meaningful uh, police reform efforts. I think there's still more that has to be done. As Attorney General, I, I'm going to seek pattern or practice um, authority to conduct pattern or practice investigations when there are signs of repeat misconduct in, in, a, in a police department or a sheriff's department. Um, so there's more that has to happen. Um, you know, and on the Black Lives Matter, uh, a piece of what you're asking, you know, sometimes people say, well, why, why do you say Black Lives Matter? Because for 400 years in this country, Black lives haven't mattered. So, so to say that simply like all lives matter, you're, you're discounting, you're diminishing, you're ignoring 400 years of history in this country when that was not the case. So we really do, and I've set out and everything I've done through a lens of equity and fairness, you know, how do we close the, the, the disparities and equities and the gaps that exist, particularly along racial lines in Maryland and in this country, healthcare, education, the workplace. So Black Lives Matter. Um, and I think you've got to be very intentional and purposeful and focused on how you, you demonstrate uh, that Black Lives Matter, uh, where, where we're valued and we have um, equal, true equal opportunity in this country. Thank you. Uh, just a couple more questions. Uh, first, what is the best advice you've ever gotten from a mentor? Mike Bush, um, and, and right. you can apply Maybe. it even outside of the context of legislation. He said, Anthony, uh, you're going to be working with a, um, you're going to have an issue, an idea, and you're going to have a bill, and someone's going to vote against it. And you got to take one bill at a time, because if you then turn around and vote against that person's bill because they vote against yours, in after the first session in Annapolis, you'll never vote for anyone's bill because at some point or another, someone is not going to be the, as supportive of what you're trying to do as you'd like for them to be. And I think you can apply that in life generally. You know, we should agree to disagree. Right. We should always be searching for common ground and accept the fact that occasionally we're, we're just not going to agree on, 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 on typically it's, it's the how, not the, not the what or the why but the how. So find ways to come together in, in your personal life and your professional life. Mike Bush um, uh, sort of really highlighted that lesson for me. 
Love it. Uh, we are running out of time. Super briefly, is there anything that I haven't asked you about? Because I have one more question, but anything that briefly you want to share? No, I think you've covered it. I, I, yeah, we've covered a lot of landscape here. I know, I know. A lot of terrain. A lot of terrain. Uh, so the last question, Congressman Anthony Brown, candidate for Attorney General. Uh, the question that I ask everyone, what is your hidden secret superpower? What is a skill or talent that you have something that most folks can't do. Yeah, and I, yeah, I don't know if I can say that most post folks can't do because I'm, you know, there are a lot of people in this world, but, you know, I think, you know, one of the, one of the powers or qualities, I think, or attributes that I have is um, to apply the lessons of life. And, and, and that's not only in, in, my, in the things where I'm successful, but where I'm not successful. And also to, to be adaptable. You know, for example, when I graduated high school, I went to West Point, the United States Military Academy at West Point, 10 weeks into it. And I was doing well, but I realized like this was not for me at this time in my life. And I made a very difficult decision to go home. And then I had to apply to, uh, to other schools that I got into. But I learned from that lesson that like often when you have a lot of choice, you got to be a lot more thoughtful in how you, you know, navigate to the to to a, to a place an option that really works for you um i i applied sort of like a similar lesson when i when i was unsuccessful in 2014 running for governor you know you'll have successes in life and you'll have setbacks you know what are the lessons that you learn so that you can maximize your successes make the right choices and what i learned in that one is stay focused on why you, it is that you do what you do which is to serve other people so i guess the short answer is is, <laughs> is learning lessons from both your successes and your setbacks. Cool, thank you. Well, Congressman Anthony Brown, thank you so much for taking time off the busy and demanding campaign trail and your time in Congress to uh, kibitz with me today. I wish you the best, look forward to seeing you before too long. Thanks, Cheryl. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>